Well, it's been interesting listening to folks talk about climate, modelling, all sorts of interesting stuff. And I'll start with a confession. I am an underwriter and I am an engineer, Deborah, so forgive me if we get into some engineering stuff. But one of the things I thought might be helpful is maybe to look at some of the practical things. What are some of the practical things that we can do? Do we really need to be victims of all these climate events? What sort of prevention mitigation solutions are out there? And what sort of role can codes and standards play in this? And all these things kind of weave together if we are going to have safe and sustainable communities. And I don't think it really matters whether you're in a developing country or you happen to be in the first world. To expect to live in a safe and sustainable community seems to me to be a reasonable thing. So how do we share those lessons? How do we learn about this stuff? And why is it, time and again, Deborah shared some stuff about homes. These are the various things that can befall large industrial commercial buildings. But the theme is always the same. Once you've breached the integrity of the envelope of the building, you've had it. Whether it's a door, whether it's a piece of roof, the minute you breach the integrity of the building envelope, bad things happen. A huge amount of the losses that we incur really aren't due to the windstorm. It's the water that got in afterwards. So what can we do to do a better job of this? We, like Deborah, have a research campus. Um, we just spent about 140 million upgrading hours. Um, it's privately funded. There's no government money in there. It comes from our policyholders. We're a mutual company. And interestingly for an insurer, we don't have any actuaries. Um, there's not a single actuary in our company and the vast majority of us are engineers. And we start off with a belief that we ought to be able to fix this stuff. How hard can it be? How hard can it be to start understanding models? And it really all begins in this research centre. Um, on the left there, as you look at the screen, rather than building a bank of fans for industrial roofs, you can actually pressurise it from the underside and watch how that membrane will fail at a given wind speed. Deborah talked about the impact of debris. That's a simple two by four propelled at 30 miles an hour against a sheet of half inch plywood. It goes straight through. Three quarter inch, it bounces off every single time. One extra quarter inch of plywood, you stop that missile damage that Deborah was talking about. In the introduction, we, we heard a little bit about the increase in catastrophes. And this is just looking at the size of those catastrophes over the last number of years. Now, obviously a large number have been in the US, they've been on the eastern seaboard, uh, Gulf of Mexico, but you'll see Lothar's buried in there somewhere, one, two, three along. But what's happening is demographically, we have a lemming-like instinct to move ourselves into harm's way. If you look at where communities are moving to, they're moving away from the safe places like Chicago and they're going to places like Miami or the Pearl River or any of the large megalopolises in Asia. Chris, can I just interrupt a second? If anyone's left an orange flag outside... It's about to be detonated. Are about to destroy it. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, Chris. That's okay. <clears throat> What's interesting is when we look at these big catastrophes, all but two of them have been windstorms. And a very large amount of those catastrophes have been that water damage that occurred afterwards. And although this looks like it's very Floridian, it's very US, it's happening everywhere. It's just the dollars aren't mounting up quick enough. But as the emerging countries continue to emerge, their contribution to these huge losses will also go up. I don't know what to make of that. I'm sure there's a brilliant scientist there can tell me it tells you something. The only thing I could say with any certainty is the eastern seaboard of the US gets hit with a mighty number of hurricanes over a period of time. But does it matter how often they come? What does one in 200 mean? It could happen tomorrow. 
Uh, we don't use one in 200, we're more like one in 500. But I would say trying to predict this stuff is incredibly difficult. And does it really make that much difference if the building survives? If the structure that we saw in Deborah's picture is still standing afterwards, that hurricane can come every week for a week care. So why do we put so much energy into predicting some of this stuff? You try and make sense out of landfalling hurricanes. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe the actuaries can do a better job than I can of figuring out what do these numbers mean. 11, 1, 3, 33 years, 38 years, 2 years. I'm not sure whether it's climate change, whether it's cycles. As an underwriter, I don't know what to make of that. But I do know if it comes through tomorrow, it'll probably cost us about a billion dollars. That's typically what we spend on a hurricane. So we do watch them with some interest. I find it interesting, though, also looking at how Florida spiked up air conditioning. Prior to air conditioning, nobody wanted to live in a swamp year-round. We develop air conditioning, and suddenly now we have a demographic moving to Florida who can live there year-round because it's become a very agreeable place to live. And look how that population projection continues to rise. And I would posit this phenomenon, I picked Florida, we could have picked anywhere in the world and, and used the same sort of thinking. Gilbert White, does everybody know Gilbert White? It was kind of the master of floodplains, modelling, floods. I thought this was pretty interesting. Floods are an act of God, but flood losses are man-made. It's the stupid things that we do that put us in harm's way. We try and look at things like impact assessment. As I say, we're a bunch of engineers, um, so only us could come up with models like this and treat a building as a wing and look at pressure differentials and the aerodynamics of it. But what you find is, in any given neighbourhood, some buildings survive and some don't. And it's not by chance. Those that are built well do far better. So what does a model do for us? Um, I took the names off to protect the innocent. There are really four um, principal competing models, or complementary models, depending on how you look at it. We use all four. And so what we did was we took um, the output from the best of those models and took a look at how did it do compared to our actual performance. So that was the leading model, and that was our actual loss. Now, it's not very helpful if you're trying to figure out how much capital you need that the leading model predicted we'd spend two and a half times as much as we actually did. So what was going on there? What, why was that model struggling to give us the right answer? The difficulty is that the population of buildings are not homogenous. They're not all Midwestern houses built in 1989 of stucco and whatever. What we found is that we had to look at a method of closing that gap. 